Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very exciting conference in the Voices of Our Time series, Why Work, Business Professions, and the Common Good. I am Blake Moran, Dean of the Law School at Wake Forest University School of Law, and I have the esteemed pleasure to serve as chair of this morning's panel, which focuses on the legal profession in the marketplace. Our panel today continues the essential conversation regarding the challenge for professionals to achieve balance between professional goals and aspirations and the commensurate responsibility to be what I have termed the citizen lawyer. Hopefully many of you have had the pleasure to hear the excellent commentary of David Brooks yesterday, who highlighted the evolution of the profession as both one who devotes her energies to the achievement of success for others while maximizing her own personal goals and aspirations. This challenge, while very intense today, has been with us for centuries. I was not a student of history while I was in college, but as I have grown older, not that much older, I must admit, I increasingly appreciate history's relevant and revelatory impact. The truism of history is that when we examine lawyers' responsibilities as they practice, we see a great deal of symmetry with what happens today. History notes that for centuries, lawyers were known as, quote, counselors of law, and were not only experts in rules and doctrines, but pillars of society that improved the state of citizens. As Roscoe Pound, the legendary dean of Harvard, once observed that the practice of law is, quote, a profession, and a profession is a group pursuing a learned art as a common calling in the spirit of public service. The historic definition of lawyer's role, however, has become somewhat overshadowed by modern realities. The business of law and the unavoidable requirement for individuals to achieve pecuniary success often comes at a cost. The pursuit of a successful business often impinges on time devoted to one's duties to society, family, and in many cases to one's self. The dominance of professional success can lead to a multiple of problems, including personal frustration, the public's negative perception of lawyers, and in some cases, periodic dissatisfaction by those who actually practice law. I'm gratified, however, that we in the profession continue to grapple with this struggle and have done so with increasing gusto in recent years. In my 15 years in the legal academy, I've witnessed a remarkable emphasis on issues of ethics, and professionalism. Social responsibility has increasingly been woven into the fabric of legal education. In fact, the Legal Academy, bolstered by the ABA requirements, encourages our students to engage in pro bono opportunities. I am also gratified by the practicing profession's willingness to lend its voice and talents to the cause for a better and improved society. The growing literature on professionalism and an attorney's responsibility to society and herself is very enlightening. I'm particularly struck by the February issue of the American Bar Association magazine, which contains a compelling article about the life of Charles Halburn, an Ivy League law school graduate who followed his soul to leave a financially lucrative law practice and pursue work that benefited the poor and more challenged individuals in society. The moral of Mr. Halburn's narrative is not the devaluation of pecuniary success, but the acknowledgement that success is the amalgamation of professional gain and one's contributions to society. Wake Forest proudly maintains as a core value the importance of work, business, and the achievement of the common good, and the university's Voices of Our Time conference and this morning's panel that includes some of the foremost national and international authorities on the topic brings these values to center stage today. It is now my privilege to introduce an order in which they speak, these exemplary individuals. At my far right, we have Mr. Robert Gray, Jr. Mr. Gray, as you note in your program, is a partner at Hunt and Williams Law Firm and is affiliated with McManaman Mediation Group Limited. He focuses on administrative matters before state and federal agencies, while continuing his practice in mediation and other forms of dispute resolution on state and national levels. He represents corporate and industry interests in, in the legislative arena and counsels businesses uh, with concerns before elected and appointed governmental officials. 
He served as president of the American Bar Association from 2004-2005, devoting his year-long term to creating better justice through better juries via the American Jury Initiative. He also worked to review, unify, and update the ABA's programs to increase, increase diversity in the legal profession and advance ABA's international rule of law efforts to safeguard the profession's independence. Mr. Gray also served as chair of the ABA House of Delegates, becoming the first African American to be an officer of that association. He also serves on the board of trustees of the Washington and Lee University. He received his BS degree from Virginia Commonwealth University and his JD from Washington and Lee. Next to Mr. Gray, we have Mr. Barry Sullivan Esquire. Mr. Sullivan is a partner in the firm of Jenner and Block, where he is co-chair of the firm's appellate and Supreme Court practice. He attended Middlebury College and the University of Chicago Law School and clerked for Judge John Minor Wisdom of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He joined General Block in 1975, became a partner in 1981, and he was an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States in 80 and 81 and dean of the Washington Lee University School of Law from 1994 and 1999. I would be remiss not to also mention that he also hired me at WNL, which I'm sure he considers a fine achievement. <laughs> He has been a Fulbright professor in the University of Warsaw and a visiting law fellow at the University of London. The author of many numerous scholarly articles, Mr. Sullivan is a recognized expert in appellate practice in such subject matter areas as administrative and constitutional law and professional responsibility. He currently serves as the editorial board on the editorial board of the Dublin University Law Journal and teaches part-time in the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies in the University of Chicago. We next have Professor Anita Allen. Professor Allen is the Henry R. Silverman Professor of Law and Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She received her BA from New College, PhD and MA in Philosophy from the University of Michigan and her JD from Harvard. A recognized authority and scholar in the areas of ethics and privacy, Professor Allen has written numerous law review articles and books. Her 2004 text, the New Ethics, A Guided Tour of the 21st Century Moral Landscape, includes a chapter on work ethics and discusses in detail the ethical issues embroiled in the Enron scandal. She also writes a monthly column in the New Jersey Star-Ledger where she comments on contemporary ethical matters such as those that came to light during the Governor Elliot Spitzer matter. And I would be remiss not to mention that Professor Allen contributes a column regularly to Oprah Winfrey's magazine O. And I should also tell you, Professor Allen, that her best friend, um, uh, Maya Angelou, is here, so I'm sure she'd be very pleased that you contribute to that magazine. To my immediate right is Dr. Christopher Whelan. Dr. Whelan is an Associate Director of International Law Programs at the University of Oxford. He has his LLB and, and PhD from the London School of Economics and an MA from the University of Oxford. He's a member of Wolfson College, Oxford, and an elected fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. Professor Whelan has over 60 publications on a variety of subjects, including the legal profession, lawyers' ethics, and access to justice, as well as corporate finance, corporate governance, and economic law. His most and well-received book is entitled Creating, Accounting, and the Cross-Eyed Javelin Thrower. And having known Chris for a number of years, I can tell you he can create a nexus between a javelin thrower, a lawyer, and an accountant. His latest article, which examines the complex dilemma of lawyers involved in the Enron scandal, takes a probative view of the lawyer's role within a complex matrix of a corporation. He is a visiting professor of law at Washington Lee University School of Law and a barrister practicing employment law at three paper buildings in London. Each of these panelists will first present a brief statement, and after they've delivered their statements, I will put forward questions that will hopefully stimulate discussion among the group. After that exchange, I will invite you, the audience, to ask questions or offer commentary on what you've heard. I want to emphasize that today is a panel discussion, but it's also a conversation, one in which we all should participate. The panelists will undoubtedly prompt us all to think carefully about the lawyer's role in society. So without further ado, let's get started with the presentation by the panelists, and our first presenter will be Mr. Robert Gray. 
Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, President Hatch, uh, thank you for having us here and the thoughtfulness in putting together such a um, uh, probative uh, panel of, of, uh, of professionals. And uh, Dean Moran, I congratulate you on your uh, becoming Dean of the Law School. We're very proud of you and all that you've accomplished. Thank you very much. Uh, and David Brooks, thank you for giving us a, a, a real start on, on this discussion. Um, it is um, uh, the conversation that you had about your own career uh, causes us great reflection. And you go back and you do some real soul searching about what you do and why you do it. Um, and at the end of the day, um, what you want to be able to say, uh, as the previous panel said before, is that somehow you made a contribution uh, to the common good. Somehow you made a difference. Somehow what you were able to do um, was, was more than uh, what you could do for yourself. You, in fact, did something that your mother could say she's proud of you for. Um, that's really the test at the end. As we look at the profession, um, it is, uh, it is interesting to note uh, and I will tell you this, that when I accepted the presidency of the American Bar Association, I stood before the ABA House of Delegates, which is 535 lawyers in one room. Everybody thinks they know Robert's Rules of Order. Um, <laughs> and I said, I stand here 40 years to the date that another lawyer from Richmond, Virginia, stood before you. He was a partner at Hunt and Williams. He was a graduate of Washington Lee Law School, and his name was Lewis F. Powell, Jr. So I'm very honored to stand here today following his leadership. What is significant about that is that in 1964, lawyers were debating whether it was feasible to establish the Legal Services Corporation, whether it would infringe on the lawyer's ability to earn a living, whether such an idea would be counterproductive to the evolution and the development of the law as we knew it then. And at its first discussion, and inception, which was rooted in the idea that everyone should have access and should be able to have representation whether they could afford it or not, in a system that said everyone was equal and should have equal access, we were debating whether it was going to infringe on the careers and the financial opportunities for lawyers. And the first reaction was a very negative reaction, that this was not a very good idea, and that maybe we should figure out some other way to help others who are less fortunate. At least we'd be the ones called less fortunate. And it was through some skillful discussion and a, a, an awakening <coughs> of the lawyer's obligation to public service, uh, and that we had a responsibility as a self-regulated profession to ensure that there was a way in which others who could not gain access would nonetheless have it to our justice system. And I don't know the exact dimensions of those conversations, but in the end, the House of Delegates, through the leadership of Lewis Powell, supported the adoption of the Legal Services Corporation unanimously. And you look at a situation and a confrontation and opportunity and challenge like that, and you ask yourself, what is it that lawyers are supposed to do, and what are their responsibilities to our society? It was 
So 40 years later, I'm faced with this, I have this opportunity to lead the profession. And I asked my colleagues, what is it you think I should do? And they said, Robert, if you could find some way to cause others to like us more <laughs> and to appreciate what we do, that would be terrific. I said, why don't you figure out something easy for me to do? <laughs> this past year, a lawyer in Richmond, Virginia, named Oliver White Hill, Jr., passed away. Oliver White Hill, Jr., graduated from the Howard Law School in 1933. He was number two in his class. And I said, Mr. Hill, who was number one in your class? And he said, it was Thurgood Marshall. And I never let him forget. <laughs> they were a special breed of lawyers. And in their time, they were the social engineers to try to make the United States a more perfect union. Their effort was aimed at providing a direction through the law in achieving a more equal society. Their effort inspired a generation of lawyers. And I am part of that generation that was inspired. To think of law as a way of making a significant contribution to society. So after I dismissed my colleagues' idea that we should find a way to become more popular, I looked at other opportunities and was persuaded by colleagues to examine the American jury system. And I did it for a couple of reasons. One is, it's the most integrated institution in our society on an ongoing basis. Think about it. Twelve citizens, or six, will sit together not knowing each other, coming from different walks of life, different cultures, different environments, different races, and religions, and are asked to find common ground in deciding a conflict that they have no interest in. It is about as pure a form of democracy as you're going to find anywhere in the world. And I said to those who work with me on it, I want this to be an opportunity for us to recommend substantial improvements to the jury system. I was fortunate to get Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as the honorary chair who called me into her chambers when I called to ask her about it and said, I know what you're here for, Mr. Gray. I'll be happy to do it. What, do you else, what else do you want to talk about? I said, well, Justice O'Connor, how's your golf game? She <laughs> says, it's great. She was someone who at every turn provided leadership and decided that this was an important opportunity for lawyers to make a difference in the lives of all Americans in the way we deliver justice in this country. Lawyers are challenged today with trying to maintain a level of sophistication and competition on a global basis. And it just it is, it, that is in competition with our notion of public service. And we are challenged to develop an environment in law firms, in law schools, in government, to not only teach and to develop great lawyers, but great lawyers with a conscience and a sense of the common good. And and a way to, to contribute to this common good in a meaningful way. Uh, 
there are other things that I think we can do uh, as lawyers uh, that are important to the development of our profession and our communities. Uh, but I am told that there are other folks on the panel that will address this issue. <laughs> so as the person to create the opening salvo, I am delighted to pass the baton <laughs> to my dean, former dean at Washington Lee Law School, Dean Sullivan. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I, too, want to thank everyone uh, for the hospitality and the and uh, the insights and uh, and just what I think has been a, an extraordinary uh, program so far. Uh, so thank you, Dean. Thank you, President Hatch. Um, Robert's uh, f finale uh, reminds me of the story that they tell about um, when Robert Benchley was fired as LBJ's speechwriter. I think that's right. And uh, and. Uh, he asked him to write one further speech for him before uh, he was actually off the premises. And uh, uh, LBJ picked up the three by five cards as he was going into the uh, uh, to the Rose Garden, and uh, uh, the first uh, number of cards said, uh, "I want to tell you, my fellow Americans, about these dire problems we have." And he went through card after card that very eloquently stated the problems that the nation faced. And finally, he got to the last card, and he was thinking to himself, this is magnificent. Why did I fire this guy? And uh, he gets to the last card, and it says, you're on your own now, LBJ. <laughs> uh, so I feel like I'm on my own now, Robert Gray. Um, I, I'd like to talk uh, just uh, in a very focused way about one particular problem this morning or one particular situation. Uh, and that is uh, sort of the point that, that Robert ended up with, uh, these forces that uh, we face in the legal profession, uh, some of which are beyond our control, some of which aren't, uh, and what the ramifications for those uh, uh, conditions are uh, for the public service responsibility of lawyers. Uh, and particularly, I want to focus in uh, on the world of so-called elite law firms uh, and uh, where I see them going. Uh, the, the classic statement uh, of the public purpose of the legal profession uh, was probably that voiced by Justice Frankfurter uh, in the Schwer case when he said, the bar has not enjoyed prerogatives. It has been entrusted with anxious responsibilities. And these anxious responsibilities are not just the responsibilities that come from the fiduciary duty that lawyers uh, owe to their clients. Uh, I think with Robert that they also refer to the lawyer's traditional role as, in the words of the ABA canons, a public citizen having a special responsibility for the quality of justice. Over the centuries, uh, lawyers have adopted this robust view of professionalism, as I call it, uh, to varying degrees and, I think, truthfully, with more or less enthusiasm. Uh, since the early 1960s, however, um, and I'll go back, since I'm older than Robert, I'll go back even further than 1964. Uh, I'll go back to 1963 uh, when <laughs> President Kennedy challenged a group of leading law teachers and uh, lawyers from large firms to tackle the problems of segregation and inequality uh, by creating the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Since that time, this aspect of professionalism, I think, has played an important part in the self-image of the American lawyer. And that's been particularly true, I think, of the so-called elite law firms which have been deeply engaged with this robust view of professionalism. But elite law firms like the world, the professions in general, and the legal profession in particular have changed greatly since 1963. For example, in 1963, even the largest law firms were minuscule by today's standards, and they were organized as true partnerships. Partners deliberated, about major decisions. They knew each other as lawyers and as people. Today, the largest law firms 
are vast organizations with offices around the country, around the world. They have complex operations, hierarchies, business plans, marketing departments. They're not partnerships in any meaningful sense frequently, except in the sense that if they go bust, the partners share the liabilities. Lawyers in these firms work long hours. Partners hope for the kinds of profits that are earned by investment bankers and pay very high salaries to new associates. I think we're witnessing a major realignment and readjustment of the legal profession right now because of the forces of globalization, because of uh, forces that uh, are within uh, the law firms. Uh, large law firms merge, they become bigger, they evolve and continue to redefine their missions. Among other things, a progressively smaller number of firms compete for a relatively tiny segment of the legal services market. Clients who need the most sophisticated services and are willing to pay the very highest rates. These firms, um, these firms judge themselves and each other largely by reference to a single metric, profits per partner. I think that two of the watershed moments in uh, modern law occurred that year, I think it was back in the 1980s, uh, when more Supreme Court clerks went to investment banks than to law jobs. And law firms found themselves trying to compete for those young lawyers in the years following by increasing salaries. The other, of course, is when the American lawyer uh, first discovered that it would be a very profitable thing uh, to do a survey of the profitability of law firms. And those two uh, events, I think, had a tremendous effect on the legal profession. Many of these changes, I want to say, uh, are very good in the sense that they produce greater expertise and efficiency and serve the interests of clients. Moreover, notwithstanding the pressures imposed by the profit per partner metric, many large firms continue to provide many hours of public service, of service to the poor, the public interest, the bar, the profession. Many take on unpopular causes, such as the defense of the Guantanamo detainees. Some actually have increased their commitment to public service as they've achieved greater prominence in the profession. The question that interests me, though, is whether at the end of the day, when the Darwinian forces come to a temporary rest, the handful of mega firms left standing with far-flung operations and corporate, non-corporate organizational structures, serving a relatively small universe of international corporate clients and increasingly beyond the means of most consumers of legal services, will be capable of providing the kind of leadership to society and the profession that the elite firms have provided in the recent past. I don't know for sure, but my hunch is that they will have a very hard time doing it. The profit per partner metric has its own logic and a natural tendency to crowd out competing values. Other features of the landscape, which I'll be happy to explain on Dean Morant's time rather than my own, also reinforce that. Perhaps some public service activities can be justified in this environment, but I think it's most likely to be the case that that will be very limited to matters that are of particular interest to a key partner or to a key client of the firm or provide an opportunity for favorable publicity. And one wonders whether such activities will carry the same weight with junior lawyers who are brought up 
and buy into that system. Now that's my doom and gloom. I think there's a bright side to this too. The new orientations of the largest firms have left much useful, profitable legal work to be done by others. Many smaller firms thrive on important legal business that the largest firms now find unprofitable. I think these trends will continue. My hope is that these smaller firms, in addition to taking up the legal business that the mega firms no longer wish to handle, will also provide the professional leadership which we have associated with the large firms in the past. My hope is that these firms will not seek success by trying to imitate the mega firms, but will embrace the freedom to be different. Perhaps the partners of the largest firms will cease to be lawyers as we have understood that calling. I hope not. If I'm wrong, however, there are others who are well qualified to fill the void. Perhaps these leaders will continue to relish their roles as public citizens, having a special responsibility for the quality of justice. Perhaps they will continue to view the legal profession as David Marquand, the British historian sociologist has written of the professions in general as one infused with an ethos of citizenship, equity, and service, constituting a space for human flourishing which cannot be bought in the marketplace. Last week, uh, thanks to a friend of mine, Judge Richard Andreas, who many years ago uh, I had the honor to, to be the chair of the American Bar Association Commission on AIDS uh, for about six years. And Judge Andreas was one of my co-commissioners, uh, was at that time the chief judge of the criminal court in New York City. He sent me last week uh, uh, serendipitously so I could share it with you, an essay uh, by uh, Joseph Epstein that appeared in the American Scholar, uh, I think a few years ago. Um, and Epstein, uh, the title of Epstein's essay is uh, Why I Am Not a Lawyer. Uh, and he talks uh, along the lines of Saul Linowitz and Marianne Glendon and so on about some of the, the uh, changing nature of the legal profession. And, uh, and he, he concludes that the problem is that uh, the reason that so many uh, imaginative, bright people either don't feel drawn to the law or having felt drawn to the law uh, are repulsed by it eventually. Uh, that the reason for this is that they uh, see the unadorned reality as business as simply an efficient form of money making and not much more. Uh, and then uh, in a paragraph later, uh, he sort of gives an O. Henry ending to this dark, gloomy view. And he says that, uh, you know, uh, really, maybe the reason that I'm not a lawyer, the reason that I'm a critic rather than a lawyer, is that it's a much easier job to be an investigator or critic of morality, which is what a writer does, than a lawyer, someone called upon to practice morality relentlessly and at the highest level, day after day after day. Thank you. Professor Allen. Thank you. Maybe some of you have had a chance to see the 2008 Academy Award winning film, Michael Clayton. In the film, there's a character who's a top senior litigator who becomes a little crazy, and he turns his attention to one of his clients uh, in a major lawsuit and decides that he has to switch sides, and he begins to undermine his own lawsuit in the name of corrective justice, environmental justice for ordinary Americans. The, um, the depiction in cinema of a top law firm, big city litigator, as a person suffering from mental illness may seem like 
a purely um, fictional exercise, something that you create in a story to tell, to uh, emphasize uh, metaphorically the notion that maybe there's something a little bit uh, insane about justice. But what um, I found so fascinating about this movie was it may be one of the few times when the problem, the real not fictional problem of mental illness among lawyers was brought to the public attention. Okay, so real stories. Saul Wachter, real man, real judge, was the chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, which is the Supreme Court of New York, as, the, as you may know. Uh, judge Wachter, while a judge, had an extramarital affair. He became obsessed with his lover. She broke up with him. He began to harass her and to stalk her and also to threaten her, her children. He was arrested and convicted of extortion and other crimes and sent to federal prison. And from his prison cell, he wrote a very uh, effective memoir called After the Madness, in which he revealed that his difficulties had stemmed from bipolar illness. Another story. Ellen Sachs, Professor Ellen Sachs, is today a law professor with tenure at the University of Southern California Law School. She's a Yale Law School graduate. She worked after Yale Law School as a public interest lawyer, and her uh, autobiography came out last year. It's called The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness. It turns out that this exceptional young law professor has schizophrenia, and it uh, was a factor in her college education, a factor in her law school education when her law school classmates had to pull her off the roof of Yale Law School one night. And it was a factor also in her legal career. These are, again, real people. Last year at the University of Pennsylvania uh, uh, Law School, we had a very scary incident. One of our law students uh, came to believe that people of Indian and Pakistani ancestry were dangerous spies. And so this smart Ivy League law student took a gun and went to the apartment of some Asian, uh, Southeast Asian law student and began pouring bullets into the apartment. Fortunately for the student and for the, uh, his intended victims, nobody was hurt. But uh, obviously, this student's law career uh, was brought to an abrupt halt. Now, in the context of thinking about uh, the character in Michael Clayton, uh, the Professor Ellen Sachs with schizophrenia, and uh, Judge Wachter with bipolar disorder, and our, our bipolar pen law student, think about uh, Elliot Spitzer. Elliot Spitzer uh, was the governor of New York until last week. I took special interest in his case because he was my classmate. He and his wife were both my classmates at Harvard Law School, class of 1984. I don't know if Elliot Spitzer has a mental illness, but many people began to blog about Elliot Spitzer's apparent mental illness when the public learned that this person who'd been a zealous prosecutor of prostitutions and prostitution rings and had in fact signed a law to up the penalty for being a, a John, was himself uh, uh, a consumer of sex work to the tune of $80,000 in a short period of time. His behavior, perhaps sex addiction, perhaps recklessness, perhaps uh, uh, a mania, caused some people uh, in the blogosphere to speculate that he might be suffering with bipolar disorder. And we're still waiting to see what his explanation will be, if he ever gives us one, of why his uh, life of moral contradiction exploded in his face. I want you to think about those stories, those, those real stories, and the fictional one as well, as I tell you a little bit about my, my philosophy of work. Uh, to me, work is a domain of necessity, to be sure. It provides a material basis for survival. If we don't work, we risk losing our capacity to live securely and without undue want. In a way, work is just about the money. It's just about making a buck, paying the bills. But work is surely more than this. Work is also a proving ground. Jobs and professions are domains of excellence. Work calls on inner strength and character. Jobs and professions ask that we marshal and display our talents for higher ends. We work for social justice, for human betterment, and for personal, even as the last panel suggested, spiritual fulfillment. 
wasting one's talent is not only foolish, but for those of us who ascribe to the remnants of the Protestant work ethic, it's also a cause of shame. If we don't do our jobs well, if we don't behave well as professionals, it is a sense uh, a source of shame. The legal profession is, in my view, an ethical proving ground for the men and women who enter it. The ethical code of our profession contemplates that we are products, the expensive products, right, of higher education, law schools. The parents of my affluent law students, I just calculated this morning, probably spend a minimum of $600,000 on getting their kids through prep school, college, and then law school. These parents expect something in return. It takes money to make lawyers, and lawyers expect to make money. Traditionally, uh, big city, the big city bar worked in tandem with commercial interests, whether it's the railroads that are in ascendancy, or the oil companies, or the banks, the media, technology. Lawyers work in tandem with entrepreneurs, and lawyers are entrepreneurs. We work in tandem with other entrepreneurs, and we all make a lot of money doing it. Now, if law is going to be this proving ground, which I think it ought to be for excellence, our ethical codes must tell us something about how can we be, on the one hand, deeply concerned with producing money for ourselves and for our clients, and also be good people, people who live in accordance with traditional virtues, virtues like honesty and integrity and generosity and perseverance and fairness and courage. Now, women entered the profession in large numbers beginning in the 1970s and 1980s. And our presence has brought out some deep tensions, which were always part of the bar, but are now much more salient. And that also uh, help us to, to understand the need to think hard about how can we be both the producers of value in the monetary sense and also people who live good lives, good whole lives. So for some women, the, uh, the, the conflict may be as as, as blunt and as distinct as how can I breastfeed my baby and also bring to fruition this billion dollar corporate merger. I mean, for some women, that's literally the dilemma they face. But it's kind of a metaphor for the general dilemmas of uh, private versus public, home versus work, family versus work, love versus money, et cetera. Now, um, how does any man or woman uh, manage the, the, to be a whole good person at the same time be a good lawyer, whether they're working for the, co the commercial sector or working for public interest, some of these same problems and dilemmas exist. Um, you're going to be a lawyer, but you've got the sick elderly parents. You've got the, the sibling who's having some financial problems. How do you work with all of that and still go to work every day and be a good lawyer? Um, how do you deal with the sick children, the children who need your attention, uh, the, 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 they need your guidance? How can you be a good parent and also uh, keep those billable hours in mind? How can you do all that stuff? Well, uh, I think that um, lawyers are educated to be um, the kinds of people who have a lot of the skills they need to manage their life, although we don't actually teach people, right, in law school or in professional CLE courses, how to be these balanced individuals. We instead teach logic and reason. I used to teach logic to philosophy students. Um, we teach reliability in the sense of, you know, of you got to be on time, you got to deliver the product, you got to you know, come to work every day. But we don't teach how do you do that and also. Um, we teach lawyers to some extent in our mediation classes and so forth how to be good with people. And we teach lawyers about the importance of the demand for justice. And some of our best lawyers are supremely good with people, very good with, about on the justice questions, very reliable, very smart, very logical. But, but let's not fool ourselves. And this is, I guess, where I want to bring this, this around and, and, uh, to, and link it back to my opening uh, stories. Let's not fool ourselves about just how rational and logical and reliable and in control lawyers actually are. Because some lawyers, first of all, bend and break the rules. They lack any sense of justice. And some lawyers are not good with people. And some lawyers are bullies. And some lawyers uh, wouldn't know how to you know, mediate their way out of a paper bag. Um, <laughs> and some lawyers buy loyalty rather than earning it. 
And some lawyers fail to live up to society's expectations, the expectations of the bar and the bench because they are not well. I'm not sure that illness explains Watergate or Enron or Monica Lewinsky, but I do think that more than we are generally willing to acknowledge, mental health conditions do affect and undermine the ability of lawyers to get produced in education sense in law schools and to be producers once they enter the, uh, the, the market of law. We don't know why sometimes brilliant minds uh, break. We don't understand everything about mental illness. What we do know is that according to the National Institutes of Mental Health, one in five Americans experiences a mental health problem every year. One in five Americans, 20% of us, are going to experience depression, anxiety, uh, distress disorders, compulsions, something that, that meets the diagnostic criteria for, uh, for a mental condition. And this figure of one in five doesn't even include people with uh, schizophrenia or, uh, or with uh, high-functioning uh, autistic disorders, for example. So just the sort of the, the less severe mental illnesses are experienced in a, in, in a very, very massive way by a huge number of us every year, including lawyers and judges. What is the bar supposed to do about this? How are we supposed to regulate our profession? How are we supposed to regulate ourselves when many of our colleagues, many of us at the highest levels, are experiencing uh, mental health problems, problems that affect our judgment about the law, our judgment about ourselves? Well, you know, one, one thing would be to say, well, let's just keep all these crazy people out of the law, you know? Let's, let's screen, our, screen our law students better so we don't have any, you know, Virginia Tech-type problems on campus. Let's prevent uh, at, the bar, at the bar admission level, let's screen out, ask a lot of questions. Have you ever taken a mental, uh, uh, psychotropic medication? Have you ever been in a mental hospital? Have you ever been depressed? We could ask those kinds of questions and then use them to keep people out of the profession. That's not what I'm going to be urging, what I would urge. We need to deal with it, but we need to deal with it in a way which accepts, in a, in a kind of funny sense, accepts abnormality as normal because so many of us will have some kind of mental health issue every year. But what do we do? I would like, you know, just to, to close my, my remarks and, and save the rest for conversation, but I would like to just you know, suggest some of the questions we need to be asking ourselves in a frank, open, uncomfortable conversation about mental illness and the law, legal profession. Let's ask ourselves questions like, um, should we um, reveal to our colleagues, our partners, that we have a mental illness? Should we reveal to our clients that we have a mental illness? Should we reveal to law schools on our admission applications that we have a mental illness? Is there a personal obligation to take those um, medications, the Prozacs, the Risperdals, the, 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 the Valiums, whatever our doctor gives to us? Uh, do we have an obligation to um, to, to, to work a little bit harder than the average person, to be a little bit less hardworking than the average person. I mean, re getting rest, getting sleep are things that people who are at risk for, say, bipolar mania have to do. But the partner in that big law firm is going to say, no, you will come in at 7 a.m. and you will leave at 2 a.m. if you have to. That kind of stress on people in combination with lives that may include uh, elderly parents, sick children, demanding spouses, travel, those kinds of lies spell disaster for people who are at risk for mental illness. What are we going to do? How can we have a conversation about how, to, how, to, how, how the, 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 the lawyer ought to behave and how we as that lawyer's colleague ought to behave in light of these very known vulnerabilities? So I just want to leave the conversation there uh, with the question of, you know, how, how do we as a self-governing profession make a space for that large um, uh, I was almost said majority of us, but I'll say that large minority of us <laughs> who uh, are at risk for uh, mental health conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Whelan. Thank you very much. Well, can I just echo uh, my colleagues' thanks to President Hatch and to Mrs. Hatch for the wonderful hospitality that you've shown us here at Wake Forest. It's been a great opportunity to meet some pe very interesting people already. I'd like to also to add my congratulations to Dean Morant. Uh, and to say that um, we do miss him and Mrs. Morant very much at Washington and Lee, and that our loss is very much Wake Forest gain. Um, what am I going to talk about today? Well, uh, I think I'm going to talk about the crisis. I want to look at the crisis that is said to exist in the legal profession and in lawyers' lives. Many of us know about Dean Cronman's view of the lost lawyer, 
uh, Sol Linowitz has been mentioned. Patrick Schlitz wrote an article with a very long title about on being an unhappy, unhealthy lawyer uh, in an unethical, unhealthy business, and so on. I want to look at that crisis today um, and see, see how true it is. We're told that today there are very, very few heroes in the law, that there are very few wise counselors in the law. Instead, what we see today, we're told, is hired guns, hired guns who whose public interest role is defined almost exclusively, it seems, in terms of what the client wants. And the client-centered approach is a characteristic, uh, it is said, of the American legal profession, and it is in sometimes contrasted with the ethos of lawyers in other countries, such as my country. Well, if there is a crisis in the legal profession, my first response is to say, well, so what? What's new? Um, sorry, law has always been a pretty tough job. It's always been a pretty stressful job. It's always been a very responsible job. Um, and not just for the hard guns, but also for the heroes. Uh, you only have to think about Atticus Finch and the kind of trauma that he faced. Now, he was a fictional lawyer, but it doesn't take long for us to think about some real lawyers. If you want to go to the movies, I think John Adams is a movie that's coming out soon. He was vilified for defending the English soldiers who shot the American colonists in Boston. Um, we think about those of us who teach professional responsibility. One of the classic cases involves the late pleasant dead bodies. And we know that the lawyer who kept confidentiality in that case, his health, his marriage, his practice all suffered because of how he addressed what he saw as a, 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 an ethical dilemma, which he felt duty bound to, to resolve in a particular way. Um, we know that practicing law can be life threatening, literally. Uh, we only have to think of Saddam Hussein and three of his lawyers who were murdered, one after being pretty brutally tortured. John Demjanjuk, the uh, man accused of being a, a Nazi concentration camp guard. Uh, one of his lawyers committed suicide. Uh, another of his lawyers at the funeral had acid thrown at him. Uh, and one of the ironies in that case was because the lawyer was having a, a year of medical treatment, the Berlin Wall fell. Evidence came out from behind the Berlin Wall that, that exonerated John Demjanjuk. Um, one of the lawyers for the Oklahoma bombers, not McVie, but one of the others, has had to, had to leave his community because of threats that he faced in his community. A friend of mine, Professor David Goldberger, a professor at Ohio State, a man from a Jewish community, when he defended uh, Ku Klux Klan, Nazis, racists, he became an outcast in his own community. It's not an easy job. And on a lighter note, it can also be an embarrassing job. It was only last week, I think, that the, the lawyer defending, or not defending, the lawyer representing Paul McCartney in his divorce case with Heather Mills McCartney at the end of the trial had water thrown over her by the party who was not obviously very happy with the judgment. So many lawyers will have wondered, is this job worth it? Representing clients everyone hates especially if, if, you, if you lose the case. So it's a tough job. It's always been an unpopular job, too. Everybody knows the Shakespeare quote about lawyers, even though that's actually quoted out of context. But w lawyers are unpopular. Why are they unpopular? Well, we, we, Anita's mentioned Watergate. There are lots of bad lawyers out there. We know that. Uh, in, more locally here in North Carolina, we think of Michael Nifong uh, as a bad lawyer. And I want to mention one or two other bad lawyers in a moment. Lawyers do silly things. They do very silly things. They invite ridicule, sometimes through their frivolous lawsuits, sometimes through their advertisements. There's a billboard in Chicago which uh, says something to the effect of, life is short, get a divorce. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally, I think lawyers are unpopular, unpopular because of the job they do. It's actually not the bad lawyers and the silly lawyers. It's actually the work that lawyers do creates unpopularity. Um, lay people often have a, a hard time with lawyers simply doing their job. And the third thing that's not new is that law has always been a business. It's always been a business as well as a profession. It's always been a way of making a living as well as a public service. Um, we heard a little bit about Abraham Lincoln yesterday. I guess he's one of the lawyer heroes in this country, but he never went to law school. He was a businessman, like other people in the 19th century business race. His card, Abraham Lincoln's card, 
refers to his customers. He talks about my customers, not his clients. So many lawyers will ask themselves, why work? Why lawyers work? And that historical perspective, that very brief nutshell, makes us ask the question, well, what is new? What's new today about the crisis? Well, we have to acknowledge, as Barry has said, there has been a transformation in the legal profession in the last 20 or 30 years. There have been some important changes in the way that we practice. Uh, the rise in numbers, the influx of women, the rise in the number of law school places. The number of lawyers in this country and in other countries around the world has, has grown exponentially, much faster than the general rise in population. That's created uh, an effect. And one of the effects, clearly, is that the legal profession steadily has lost control of the market for legal services. The intrusion of the marketplace has had a series of effects. Clearly, influx of competition is new and has an effect. Specialization, bureaucratization, and if you like, what one of the values that has clearly come more overtly into the legal profession is the fundamental commercial value of consumer sovereignty. So there have been significant changes. Um, and these changes have challenged the role and the responsibilities of lawyers. For many lawyers, the lawyer-client relationship is less about clients and more about consumers. We know that clients shop around for lawyers and law firms. Law firms compete in beauty parades to try and attract particular clients. You need to have rainmakers. Some lawyers try to drum up business in ethical ways. Some try to drum up business in not-so-ethical ways. Now, many believe that the intrusion of the marketplace has led to a decline in professionalism, decline in civility, a, a loss of independence, a loss of the exercise of independent professional judgment, and so on and so forth. And instead, new values have taken their place, especially greed. Was it greed when lawyers introduced the securities class action suit? That particular method was said to have been invented by Melvin Weiss of the law firm Milberg Weiss and his colleague William Lerach. They won millions of dollars, as did Richard Scruggs. Richard Scruggs actually won billions of dollars in tobacco lawsuits. Now, where are, those, where are, they, where are these three lions of the trial bar now? Answer, they're behind bars. They're in prison. Melvin Weiss pled guilty last week to federal criminal charges. He hid side payments to plaintiffs in class action suits. No wonder the firm is no longer Milberg Weiss, it's now Milberg. Scruggs pled guilty to trying to bribe a state court judge in Mississippi. Was this greed? And what about the work-life balance we hear so much about, the shift from heroes in the legal profession to hired guns? Is the marketplace to blame? Well, my thesis is I'm not so sure it is to blame. It's clearly important, but I don't understand that it can be fully attributed to explain what's going on. And for further proof of this, I want to add to the historical nutshell that I've presented, a comparative nutshell, uh, an English perspective. Why do I want to give you an English perspective? Well, not only have there been similar transformations in the English legal profession as you see here, exponential growth and so on. Not only are the systems fairly similar, there are clearly some important differences, but it's an adversarial legal system. Um, and in England, lawyers are unpopular and many of them are regarded as silly. Uh, just because I told you about the billboard in Chicago, I have to tell you about the uh, men's room in the city of London. If you go to a wine bar, in the city of London financial district and you, you go to the men's room, you will see a poster from a solicitor's firm saying, uh, inviting you to get a divorce with the headline, Ditch the Bitch. Um, now that, of course, is okay because if you go to the ladies' restroom or bathroom, whatever you call it here, they will, the same firm has an advertisement in the ladies' restroom which says, all men are bastards. So there's no discrimination, at least. So lawyers have the same criticisms that, that lawyers have here. So, so what, is the, what is the comparative point? The comparative point is this. Arguably, nowhere has the intrusion of the marketplace occurred more than in the legal services market in England. Um, the 
Thatcher revolution began in the 1980s, the attack on professionals and professionalism, the introduction of so-called market discipline, which was begun arguably by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, is now almost complete. What are some of the highlights of this change? Well, almost anyone in England can offer legal advice and assistance. There are very, very few restrictions on what you call the unauthorized practice of law. Um, most English lawyers do not enjoy the professional autonomy that American lawyers enjoy. Um, and the Thatcher Revolution has made things even worse, if that's the right way of putting it, because very soon lawyers in, in England can practice in so-called alternative business structures with external non-lawyers investing in their firms. Firms can actually be owned by non-lawyers, and in Australia we now see the first law firm listed on the stock exchange, shares floating freely in the, in the market, and a publicly traded law firm. So we are in the dawn, we are at the dawn of a new era, and the phrase is, it's an English phrase, but I'll convert it, I'll translate it into an American phrase. We're, on, we're, we're at the dawn of an era called Walmart Law. And again, I want to give you an imaginative picture of what that is like. You've got to imagine the scene. You're shopping in Walmart. What a relief from the marital strife you're encountering at home. And you see the offer on display. Get a divorce today, win some air miles, see the lawyer at the checkout. You're being sold a divorce, and the offer is too good to resist. What better way to get a divorce? What, way, what, what, what better way to get over a divorce than a vacation to some nice exotic destination? Or, alongside ready-made meals, you have ready-made wills. Two for the price of one, an offer too good to resist. Now, I'm character, caricaturing it but it's not that much of a caricature. It really is that era that is dawning in the English marketplace. It may sound daunting, but that's what the comparative perspective offers. So what's the comparative point? Well, it's this. Have the core values of the legal profession been sacrificed in England? Have they been sacrificed on the altar of the marketplace? No. Is there a crisis in the legal profession? And more importantly, in the lives of lawyers in England? No. Have the core values such as independence, the exercise of independent professional judgment, have they been lost? No, they appear to have survived. Not only barristers with their inns of court and their collegial community and their wigs and gowns, but solicitors too appear still to believe in the purpose that we've talked about of the legal profession. Now, I'm not suggesting things are rosy. I'm not suggesting things are just, just, there are no problems. But lawyers still seem to believe in their public interest purpose. They don't see themselves exclusively as instruments of their clients. What explains the differences? As I mentioned before, there are clearly very important differences in the two legal systems, and there's no time to go into them. What I wanted to do instead, instead was just to suggest a couple of factors why there may be a different self-image of lawyers in England, which may help them cope with the stresses, the strains uh, that they encounter in their workplace. The purpose is work, but the, but the work still has meaning. I'm quoting now actually from David Brooks from yesterday. The purpose in, is work, but it also has meaning. The law offers success, but it also offers significance. It offers material gain, but it also offers moral value. How come? And I just want to point to two factors that I think are very, very important, two structural factors that influence how people perceive themselves. Mentoring and monitoring. M&Ms is the way to recall it, if you wish to recall it. M&Ms. Because in the English legal profession, all English lawyers are mentored at the start of their careers. It's not an option. It's structured into the training of an English lawyer. You might call it apprenticeship. They don't like that word anymore. But lawyers to practice have to spend one or two years being mentored. And in fact, if you're a normal lawyer in England, you can't practice by yourself for five years after you qualify. So you will encounter many more years of mentoring. More importantly than mentoring, I think, is monitoring. English lawyers are monitored. 
law and economics, the economist will know the significance of, of monitoring the governance and, and so on and so forth, the costs and so on. The English legal profession seems to be able to monitor what lawyers do in a way that may affect how lawyers actually behave. Uh, and who are they monitored by? Answer, other lawyers. Barristers are monitored by solicitors. Uh, my client as a barrister, I have two clients. I have a lay client and I have a person who's called the professional client. That is the solicitor who sends me work. That professional client is monitoring what I do. And if I deviate, that person knows about it. But I'm also monitoring the solicitor. The solicitor knows that they're going to be having to deal with other lawyers on a regular basis. And I think that monitoring dimension also has a significant effect. Final point is I'm not saying things are better in England. What I am saying is structures matter. And you can find structures in the American legal profession, in pockets of the American legal profession. Corporate Delaware, uh, Delaware, Delaware lawyers who work in the corporate sphere, there is a monitoring and mentoring dimension in that environment, and you see a consequence in terms of collegiality and the way lawyers behave. You see it in family lawyers in Maine, research has shown that you see it in rural lawyers in, in, in Missouri and so on. I, I'm just emphasizing the importance, I think, of, of structures. So I hope that's some food for thought. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, panelists. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize to the audience is that this is a conversation. And so um, I had originally said I'm going to put forth some questions to the panel and uh, panelists in general. But if, if you think about um, various kinds of uh, factors or questions or other kinds of issues that you are inspired by the presentations, do raise your hand as I ask the questions and I'll see you and then recognize you. We have microphones here and I think some of the assistants will bring the microphones to you. So I'm going to get things started with a sort of, uh, of what I call a macro. Uh, question that basically sort of ties together a lot of the themes that I heard in all the presentations which were absolutely wonderful from their perspectives. And we've, so, we've heard this um, sort of amalgam, if you will, of what I call attention in our profession. And that is on one end, we are to be professionals who are going to be successful in terms of making a livelihood and pursuing justice as we so call it with regard to the matters that we basically face. And that is a core value that we have as, as, as basically articulated by Mr. Gray um, at the very beginning. But then we also see that there's a tension that we have uh, as well. And that our historic obligation in addition to finding justice is that we are to be the kinds of citizens who recognize our social responsibility. But there's so many things that basically pull against that. Either the human frailties, the ones that Professor Allen basically outlined very, very well, the um, profit, for par uh, profit for partner metric that, um, that Mr. Sullivan talked about, and of course this sort of overarching theme that we sort of see in the profession that we have all of these various tensions that basically draw attorneys into choosing one or the other. And I guess my overall macro question is, why is it as a profession, should we be concerned with the lawyer's dilemma in this regard? Why is this such an important issue for us to discuss? And why is it, or I should say, what are the manifestations that we could suffer if we don't focus our energies on helping attorneys to grapple with that tension between their professional responsibility in terms of finding justice and the other parts that basically fulfill them as professionals in terms of social responsibility and their responsibility to themselves and their families. That's a very good question, Dean. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think part of this is sort of rooted in the history of this country. Um, uh, this is a country that uh, decided that it was going to be important uh, to establish itself on principle based on the rule of law and that this w we would have a representative government and that we would have balance of power between the branches of government and that there would be a way for citizens to participate both through voting and serving on juries. Mm -hmm. And our system, our democracy 
has evolved with lawyers and judges uh, being very much involved in in the in in how we define our society. If lawyers get preoccupied with just making money, um, then that hand on the rudder causes the ship of democracy to go out of control. I think lawyers have a responsibility that is over and above making money to making sure that uh, the way in which laws are enacted, the way laws are interpreted, and the way laws are applied are done so with, um, with a, a notion of impartiality, uh, with fairness, with equity, um, and, and that they develop in a way that promote um, the values of society. I mean, it, it is not an easy task. Uh, being a lawyer is not trying to win a popularity contest, as others have, <laughs> have described it. Uh, but it is important, uh, I think, in our work uh, to make sure that, that, uh, uh, that we learn from our predecessors who had the courage to stand up and say the executive branch is wrong and this is not the way it should be done and we're going to challenge that. Um, and, and conversely, it, it, is, it is our responsibility to also make sure that an, an impartial judiciary is promoted in this country um, and that if the political branches of government uh, both the uh, congressional and executive decide that due to unpopular decisions, it's time to rearrange the judiciary, that lawyers have to stand up and say that's not its purpose, to be rearranged for political gain. They stand ready to do their work in support of advancing the interpretation uh, of, of the law in an impartial manner. And it is important that lawyers uh, are able to make that statement mm -hmm. and that that is part of uh, their service uh, to the common good. Yeah. Um, I, I just I, I think that's so true. Um, I'll just add a couple of words to that. Um, when, when I was dean at Washington Lee uh, and um, we would have commencement, I would remind the graduates at commencement uh, that the the, the practice of law, the calling of law, was essentially a countercultural activity. Uh, I'm not sure that the parents who had spent uh, all those <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, getting their children to that point appreciated it. Uh, but what I meant by that is that, you know, we're interested in process, for example, when a lot of people aren't interested in process, it's inefficient, it's inconvenient, it ought to be got over. Uh, we're interested in drawing the lines uh, between the executive and the judicial and the legislative. Uh, we tend to get in the way. And we tend to get in the way, which I think we like to think in the short term may be inconvenient, but in the long term is very beneficial. When I think back to the people who uh, mentored me as a young lawyer, Judge Wisdom and Judge McCree and uh, lawyers in Chicago like uh, Burt Jenner, um, Ed Rothschild, who mm -hmm. was the, the head of the uh, board of the ACLU when he authorized David Goldberger to bring that suit in the uh, Skokie March and who himself was Jewish. Uh, Alex Elson, who died last week at the age of 103, who was one of the people called to Washington by President uh, Kennedy in 1963. Uh, all those people achieved a great deal uh, by being countercultural in that very deep and rich sense. Um, you know, it's interesting as I, as I sort of ruminated on this issue of why it's important. And one of the things that uh, came up, and I think this relates to Professor Whelan's comment, and that is that if we are not concerned about this, a couple of things can happen. First of all, the public's perception of lawyers, which I think is a very important dynamic in terms of, of instilling trust in those who are actually going to pursue justice. 
And I think the other part about it, too, has to do with the lawyer's fulfillment of her, I guess, professional self, that there is, it is so endemic in the practice of law of not only pursuing one's professional success in a pecuniary way, but as Charles Halpern in that article that I addressed at the very beginning, to fulfill your soul in what you're doing. And I think a number of you basically commented on the fact that what we do as our work becomes a part of us. And so it is a very important uh, issue for us. I think I saw a hand. Why don't we just pass laws that require, if you want to practice law in the state of X, you have to do 50 hours of pro bono. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Very good. There is a, um, a temptation to think that, well, if lawyers or accountants or doctors or architects are not honest, let's just pass laws that mandate ethics. And so a very large question that we all face in every profession is, to what extent should we have ethics be seen as an internal uh, matter of self and group regulation versus a set of positive uh, rules that require us upon threat of penalty to behave in a certain way? And I guess I, I think that, that we should not be shy about passing the equivalent of Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, <laughs> across many domains. But we have to be cautious in, because what happens sometimes is that uh, people then see the ethical rules as simply other rules and laws to gain. Mm -hmm. So if the focus is on creating external norms, I think you'll have uh, lawyers and other professionals trying to gain those norms in order to seek advantage. But if we do something to address the inner sense of value, the inner sense of purpose, uh, the commitments we ought to take on as individuals and as, as a profession to serve the public, to serve our clients, we're going to be better off going down that way. So I would like to see the profession have better conversations and take more action than to see legislatures sort of jump in and try to, to make us uh, with, a, with a baseball bat do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? Yeah, please. I mean, I think, I think the point about gaming the law, I think, is quite a significant point. And, I mean, over, over time, the way that the profession has been regulated here has, has moved away from a kind of a, a broad, spirit-based, you-should-know-best-as-a-lawyer approach, the intuitive approach, to a to a more regulated, more rule-bound. Uh, in fact, the, the model rules of professional conduct and state professional rules are very often used as the legal standard for assessing whether or not a lawyer has complied with, with their requirements. And I mean, I think there's a danger. If we think about law in, in that kind of opportunistic way, that's, what, that's where I see as one of the key issues about professional responsibility, about self-esteem. And it goes back to the, to the question you raised, Dean, which is about... There's a top-down view of, of what the legal profession is and what it represents, and, and Robert Gray's expressed that very, very well. But there's also a bottom-up approach, and if it's a bottom-up approach which, which is client-centered, mm -hmm. the danger I see is that law becomes an instrument. Law is an instrument for the client. Law, law has no public value in itself. It just becomes another way of advancing the client's interests, often at the expense of the public interest that lay behind the law. And, I, I, you know, so I'm, I'm, in response to your question, I, I'm, I'm against Sarbanes-Oxley type approaches because it just encourages me to play around with the rules. And if I'm not, if I, where does it say I can't do it is my response to the regulator, to the enforcer. Where does it say I can't do what I did rather than a kind of a, an inbuilt intuition that this smells wrong. I know this is wrong. I know that fax that inadvertently arrived on my desk. I should send it back to the other side, not... I should go to my client and say, what should I do? Should I read it? <laughs> may, may I interject? Because I think there was a second part to the questioner's question that I'd like to sort of tweak a little bit if the questioner doesn't mind. And, and that is this idea of mandatory pro bono. I think that was another part uh, of your question. And of course, you know, we've addressed the, the whole idea of having rules, and we know what rules do in terms of um, their ability to actually sort of inculcate behavior and how they can be gamed. But I think the interesting part of that question with regard to the pro bono one is what would be the harm if we were to have some kind of, of norm which says that every lawyer is required to do so many hours of pro bono activity? We already, we already know that many jurisdictions already require us to do um, uh, continuing legal education. 
And I've got to say, as, as um, a licensed lawyer who's an academic, and as I'm doing academic work and I still have to do CLE, I would like to game that rule for sure. <laughs> but, but it's a very interesting question. Why not have some kind of general and not overly onerous, but a general requirement that as a function of being a licensed attorney, you should have some type of pro bono activity? Well, in Illinois, we have a shame system uh, that I think we don't have. <laughs> we don't have an actual obligation to do pro bono work that's enforceable in terms of number of hours, I don't think. But we have to report uh, how many hours of pro bono work that we've done and also uh, what contributions we've made. Uh, to uh, organizations that provide legal services in the public interest or uh, to the poor. I, I have been very impressed in Philadelphia by the number of law firms that do uh, uh, extend pro bono services to various types of clients, including some of the, the poor West Philadelphia children on, on, uh, on whose uh, behalf I do a lot of uh, not-for-profit work. So, uh, you know, maybe we, we wouldn't be all that burdened by a rule because we already do it, you know, in so many situations. I am afraid, though, that, that, that getting the bar, the ABA, for example, once again focused on the pro bono question is a distraction, a distraction from these issues about uh, work-life balance and, and health and sure. so forth that I think need to be uh, higher up on, on, the, on the agenda today. We've, we've been through all that pro bono discussion before. Lawyers are doing pro bono work. And I think we need to instead focus on how can we, we uh, find that inner strength and that, that work-life balance that's going to make us all better lawyers. I see several hands. I'm going to Dean, start. let me just, oh, just please, inject please. one thought on, on the pro bono side. It, it is a uh, – I think it is still an ongoing challenge uh, in the evolution mm -hmm. of the business side of, of, of practicing law mm -hmm. uh, to maintain a focus uh, on pro bono activities. And, and it's a leadership issue. It's a leadership issue within the firms. It's a leadership issue within the professions, within the profession itself. Uh, uh, I'm one of the things I'm I'm getting involved with with my firm uh, this year is pro bono work, and we are having a conference, uh, a retreat of those chairs of the pro bono committees of the various 17 offices of the firm uh, for the first time. Uh, that and that. And the goal is going to be, can we get every lawyer in every office to do something that the firm can report 100% participation in pro bono work? Um, the first idea was, let's have everybody do a minimum of 50 hours, which was the, the question that was raised. And it just didn't go anywhere. <laughs> just didn't go anywhere but I but I but it is one of the one of one of these activities that you have to understand is not accepted by every lawyer in the same way it's not one size fits all but the idea that some of us that everybody can do something is important in in the in the culture and the psychology uh, of, of, of of practicing law and fulfilling your obligation to public service. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. I see a number of hands. I'll start here. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, Bill Sullivan from the Carnegie Foundation. Um, I was really struck by, by this conversation in reference in relation to the earlier one. For those of you who weren't here, the earlier panel really dealt with the larger theological uh, religious issues of vocation. And in that panel, it struck me that, uh, to find fault with my esteemed colleague, there was a general tendency to run down institutions, that individuals were good, uh, there were problems in society, and if there were problems, we would solve it largely by making better individuals. And it strikes me that, uh, I mean, this was something I should say uh, some years ago when we were doing research that led to Habits of the Heart and then a subsequent book that got less attention than habits, but I think is in some ways more important for today, the good society, uh, we found that Americans in general are allergic to institutions, <laughs> that they fundamentally don't believe in them, and they don't really see them much of the time. And I'll say a few things about this later today, but apropos here, Alexei de Tocqueville, back when he wrote the, the 
great book, The Democracy in America, said lawyers in America are the aristocrats of America. And what he meant by that was, as he went on to say, that they're the only group in America that seems to have a sense of what the Europeans call a sense of the state, a sense that what makes it possible for people to live together well are stable patterns of shared belief and understanding that aren't just in their heads, but actually are represented in the functions of society. And so the question I, I would put, and this I think in many ways is really to uh, Professor Whelan, but to anyone else, that what you were calling structures uh, earlier, I would interpret as at least if not the uh, full blown, the remnants or the, the core of an institution where to be, to practice a, a craft really requires that you uh, are constantly reminded that you are a member of a collectivity pledged to certain purposes which maintain certain standards, etc. And it, I wonder if, if the panel has any thoughts about that. That I would take that to be what law really is, what the legal profession really is, yeah. is something along that line. Well, if I can go first, I mean, I, I mean, I think there's a lot in that. And I think what, one of the themes that seems to underpin this conference, I think quite rightly, is that there's been a breakdown in a whole series of institutions in society, family, religion, and so on and so forth, and a shift to, a, to, a, to, a, to an individualist approach. And I think what, what my remarks were trying to address was, yes, that's happened, but the way we behave as individuals is affected by, I just use the word structures. And that's not a technical term. It's just a way of thinking about the fact that, if it is a fact, that the way we learn is significantly through copying, um, through copycats, whether we call it culture or, or whatever. But we copy. Why is there a different culture in some law firms than others? It's a difficult question. But, but if I go to a law firm, I'm going to learn the culture there, and I'm going to copy it. And I, it starts in law school. It's interesting. Dean Moran talks about pro bono. Some American law schools require pro bono by their students. It, it, it yours does. So it's, it's, it's actually part of the very fabric. beginning fabric, mm -hmm. right at the start. Uh, just as a brief story, I, I, I teach professional responsibility, and I, I ask two questions at the beginning of my course. I, one is, would you, would you be here if it wasn't compulsory? Very few hands go up. <laughs> the sec second question is, are you going to adhere to my policies? My, well, I, have a, I have a laptop policy which says you can only use your laptops in class for so so forth. Halfway, a few weeks ago, I, I sent around an email to all my 75 students and said, has anybody violated this rule? And basically, 80, 90 percent had violated it. I had students in my office in tears, literally, because they obviously thought there were some repercussions of this breach. Of <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's quite interesting work by David Lubin, who talks about a slippery slope. And, you know, so, so I, my new copy, my nine lives of copycats, it starts with laptop abuse. First, your associate becomes discovery abuse. Then it becomes billing abuse. And it's step by step down a path where it may be shielding science documents, which are really not privileged, and so on and so forth. It may be coaching in the Baron and Bud asbestos type situation. It may be writing the defense for the client instead of representing the client. And it may be, you know, it's a slippery slope. And I think fabric structures need, need to be there to, to encourage people to copy, copy the good. Very good. We're, we're quickly running out of time. I thought I saw some more hands. Um, Maureen, did you have a question? Her partner uh, has a very strong, unfortunately strong pull. In light of that, what argument would you make to law firm leadership uh, in favor of pro bono against the notion that an hour lost to pro bono equals dollars in the door also lost. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question, but... The, the question is, uh, and, and Mr. Gray also spoke about his efforts, uh, how do you encourage a cultural change in favor of pro bono? Maybe that's a better way to Yeah, uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And it goes back to what Bill Sullivan was talking about in terms of institutions. I think one thing that Robert and I both touched on was the importance of the law firm. 
uh, in, in all of this as a source of, of values. And um, I think that, that there are two things that are important about pro bono. One is to encourage people individually to do pro bono work. I think that another part of the problem, though, is an institutional problem for the firm because, you know, you can always require uh, an associate to, to work 50 hours more. You can require a partner to work 50 hours more. Uh, but the real question is when the firm is confronted with a big case that is going to take thousands of hours to do, will the firm have the internal culture to be willing to take on that case. I think if, if the leadership of a firm could come to see the firm as having an obligation to take on a big case like that, uh, then I think that it becomes a lot easier uh, to get everybody in the firm to be committed to doing pro bono work of their own. And I think in the end, that, um, you know, I was thinking earlier that uh, I was telling Robert last night at dinner that uh, I was appointed in about 1983 by the Illinois Supreme Court to represent a man convicted of killing two Chicago police officers and sentenced to death. And I worked on that case probably for three or four years and eventually had the conviction reversed. Uh, this eventually led to an Amnesty International investigation of the Chicago Police Department and many, many years later led to a moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois. Uh, I worked for thousands of hours on that case, which I, I really couldn't justify. Uh, but I think that, that the fact of the matter is that I may have billed a few less charge hours to clients during those years, but it wasn't many less. And so the firm was really getting their money's worth out of me, despite the fact that I had taken on this case. And I think that leadership in a firm, as Robert said, is everything. Uh, when I was a young lawyer, uh, Burt Jenner thought that it was every lawyer's responsibility to do pro bono work, uh, to be engaged in law reform. And that was what people in the firm were brought up thinking as, as lawyers. I think that, uh, I think the economic argument really, you know, the opportunity costs really aren't quite what they look like. Uh, and I think it's really a question of, of the ethos of the firm and making people proud to be part of something that has that ethos. Quick, foot, quick, quick footnote. Um, if your model of pro bono is, you know, death penalty appeals and, you know, massive class actions on behalf of hundreds of thousands of poor people and, and law reform, it gets to be ex potentially expensive, not necessarily, but potentially. But there are other ways that lawyers can do pro bono that aren't so demanding. Uh, one of the law firms that, that we work with in, in Philadelphia uh, through a not-for-profit that I'm the chair of the board of, we just get the lawyers to come down and spend an hour tutoring kids in public school, which is a tremendous service to the community that is not all that expensive. Or inviting 15 poor kids to come to the law firm to learn how to use the Xerox machine and word process. Not expensive, but it's, it's actually very, very helpful for the community. So, so let's not always think that pro bono means, you know, these multi-million dollar in, uh, uh, commitments uh, and, and, and thousands of hours of billable time. It, it could be something quite simple, but quite effective. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time and, um, and I know one of the postulates of a chair is to make sure that one does not intrude on someone's eating time, which is rapidly coming forward. But I want to take an opportunity to close with, first of all, thanking the panelists for their wonderful insights on this very important topic. Thank you very much. And as I said at the very beginning of this panel, this is a conversation, and it's one that really should continue. As you can see by the panelists' commentary and our questions afterwards, it's a complex problem, but one that cannot be solved in one fell swoop. It requires that we have a continuing dialogue on the issue of helping individuals achieve that balance between uh, achieving professional success and social responsibility. 
I trust that we all will continue to engage in that conversation. I look forward to doing so, not only with the panelists, with, with, but with everyone here at Wake Forest. And I want to thank everyone for coming out today. And I enlist you all to continue this dialogue so that we can emphasize that our profession is one that not only seeks justice for individual clients, but also seeks to enrich society as a whole. Thank you all very much.